Well, the weather is turning, irises and tulips are punching through the dirt, there's buds on trees, birds are singing, snow is gone, daylight savings time has completely disrupted my life, and that's how I know it must be spring. So today, nothing but drinks, as I share my favorite cocktails for spring with you. So what makes a good cocktail for spring? You know, I find that kind of tough to define, but also I bet you know what I mean, right? Maybe it's uh, one of those things where it's easier to start by defining what it isn't rather than what it is. So I don't think a spring drink is hot or terrifically spirit forward, um, and I don't think it's tiki. I think a drink of spring would feature fresh ingredients, bright flavors, and be easy to drink. Pleasant and refreshing without commanding attention or contemplation. By the way, this episode is going to feature a large number of drinks and a variety of bottles. And so it feels like the perfect place to really officially announce a pretty huge partnership that I am super proud of with Curiata. If you're really plugged into the world of HGD, you may already be clued into this, so sorry if you've heard this one before, but I'm working with Curiata to help you get the bottles I use on the show, which is something I get asked about a lot online. Curiata is brand new, they just launched, and basically it's a site where you can order liquors online and have them shipped directly to your home. Right now, you can check out the How to Drink collection and buy the bottles I use on the show at drink.curiata.com. But we're working together on a lot more than that, like pages dedicated to specific episodes, so you can easily find everything I'm using right now in this episode that you are watching at this moment with a single click. Uh, and those links will always be in the video description and the pinned comment below. So if you need a bottle of Suze or Maraschino or Ray and Nephew to make something you saw on the show and it's not at your local liquor store, well, it's on Curiata. And they ship straight to you and orders ship fast, generally next day. Sounds awesome, right? Because it is. Of course, there is actually a catch. So one, Curiata is available in most US states. In case you're unaware, selling spirits direct to consumers online is an extremely complex thing to navigate in the US, and that is why no one has 100% figured it out yet. But Curiata is available in most US states. Seriously, if you think there's no possible way they're shipping to you, you should check it out because the odds are that they are. Um, and the number of states that Curiata can ship to is expanding all the time. Second, shipping is not free. I know you hate that, everyone hates that, but I've got two solutions for it for you. First, at any given time on Curiata, select bottles will include free shipping. And if you happen to be buying one of those or decide to include one in your order, well, your whole order will ship free. Go to the website and see what's shipping free right now. Second though, if your order is over $199.99, you can use code HOWTODRINK at checkout and get free shipping. And it'll work 100% of the time, every time. So if you want to make any of these drinks, you want to stock up your bar for the summer, check out drink.curiata.com or use the link in the pinned comment below. Okay, let's get on with some drinks, right? I think probably the first thing that comes to mind when I shout the drinks of spring into the void that exists behind my eyes is an Aperol Spritz. And I'm probably pronouncing Aperol incorrectly. All of Europe right now is sniggering. <laughs> Aperol. <laughs> It fits the bill perfectly, right? It's effervescent, it's refreshing, it's carefree and thoughtless, it's not rocket fuel. I'm feeling a bit parched, so why don't I make one of these right away before I get into the rest of this episode? I don't actually think I've ever made an Aperol Spritz on the show either, so first appearance for the Aperol Spritz. Aperol Spritz. Aperol? Is it Aperol? Aperol? Apparel? April? Maybe many of the letters are silent, it's just like April? April! Uh, these are commonly built in a balloon glass or maybe a snifter if you like something with a shorter stem. Uh, this suits me fine. Crack some ice into your glass. Two ounces of Aperol. Aperol. I'm going to pronounce it different every single time. Always fire the OVs, open this thing uh, downrange. Get at the edge here. There we go. Most people at this point just top it up with Prosecco. Um, Ratio-wise, it should be three ounces. I mean, and I, I'm using should be in a, the, in a very light way. Um, and you could eyeball three ounces or just know where three ounces are. I am going to measure. I'm just going to measure it somewhat pedantically, okay? And then a lot of people at this point, they like to add, uh, believe it or not, two ounces of like club soda or seltzer. This is made in my I drink mate. Very bubbly. 
So that's the thing. It's a spritz, you know? It's not a drink of very powerful, strong flavors. It's pretty, it's pretty light. And, and yes, most people are going to not measure. I tend to measure things on this show because, you know, it's an informational show, ostensibly. Um, and garnish usually with an orange wedge or two. I do not eat enough oranges. I fucking love these things. A little bit, too much peel there. And then garnish with an orange wheel. There you go, my spritz. This is an April spritz. All right, I can see that my April was sitting largely at the bottom. No harm in stirring it up and kind of really incorporating it. It's delicious. I mean, this is a sweet, light, fresh kind of candy summer cooler. I have a feeling my wife will like these a lot when I start making them again this summer. I like that. It's a little bit bitter, but very mildly. I mean, way less than like a gin and tonic, way less than anything with Campari in it. Just enough so that it's like, ooh, a little bite to it. It's fresh, it is cold, it is a little light, it's bubbly. It has a lot of orange notes in it because I think that you'll find that orange, oh, something in my eye. I think that you'll find that orange is a really dominant flavor in Aperol. This garnish is kind of driving me nuts. And you know what? Just put it in the drink. Honestly, I think it's even better that way. Um, just kind of go nuts with it. Feels like a glass of spring. Good in the summer too on a hot day, honestly. And you know what? These oranges, they're delicious. Why would I waste them? I'm not going to waste them. If you were a kid in the 90s, you had a soccer team, which I was on for like five seconds because I hated running. At some point, there would be halftime. Orange wedges, kids, you got orange wedges. So you don't get, so you don't get cramps, you got orange wedges. Like that fucking matter, yeah. The other thing I don't think people do anymore is pasta parties. They used to tell the kids who were like into sports, oh, you got a pasta party the night before, to carb up so you have energy tomorrow. I think that was some crap that Berea came up, Barilla came up with the, pot, the, the spaghetti company. I don't, I don't see how waking up with a belly full of spaghetti is gonna help you win any races or whatever. You can make a spritz with other aperitivos as well, like Campari, but I think the Aperol is the standard by which others must be judged. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, a year or two ago, the New York Times did an article on the Aperol spritz being a bad drink. Who cares? Spritzatura. But if the spritz wasn't the, as I'm spritzing, I'm my own spritz. <laughs> If the spritz wasn't the first drink that sprang to mind when I started talking about spring cocktails, I'm gonna bet that it was a Pimm's Cup, right? It's gotta be a toss up between those two. Personally, I respect the fact that these are a staple in the UK and the people love them. I have yet to personally find a build that I really adore. I would go with a spritz over the Pimm's Cup, but not everything is everyone's cup of tea. I'm told that the way to do these is really in a pitcher and as you refill the pitcher through the day, the balance moves more and more in favor of the pims and away from the lemon soda. Uh, that would be lemonade for the UK portion of my audience. Over here, we would not call that lemonade. A thin ribbon of cucumber, maybe some sliced apples, sliced strawberry, stuffed into a glass or pitcher with two ounces of pims, which is basically a liqueur built from gin, uh, and four ounces of lemon lime soda. Not my favorite, but they are undeniably refreshing and light and easy to drink, fun to share. Really, honestly, they are a perfect spring drink. If it's if I'm at a garden party, which I find myself at not that often, but if I were and you offered me a Pimm's cup, uh, I would say, yes, sir, thank you very much. I will enjoy this. Instead, I'm having this. It is really good. <laughs> I think my wife and I are having those tonight after I wrap. I mean, we have a bottle of Prosecco here. Why not? So this is a drink I do adore. It's a garden in a glass. It is the Sherry Cobbler. It is positively ancient by cocktail standards going back to the early 1800s, and it is credited with making the drinking straw popular, actually. So before that, no drinking straws. Uh, shake up a few orange slices, uh, half an ounce of simple or gum syrup, four ounces of Amontillado sherry, Lestau is fine here. Garnish it with everything you've got. Um, like just throw the kitchen sink at it. Berries, oranges, mint, whatever. Uh, the garnish should be a flooring bouquet of abundance. You know, it really should exemplify spring. That is traditional. Uh, that is that goes back to when it was invented in the 1800s. A garden in a glass, you know. I think that they're really perfect for those afternoons when it's just too damn nice to convince yourself to stick to work and you just need to emerge from your winter hibernation for a few hours and get out on the deck or lawn or whatever and knock off for a bit. So a similar drink in both its dependence on crushed ice and its ancientness is the mint julep. The official drink of the Kentucky Derby, which always falls in spring. This year, I think it's actually April 30th or May 1st. So it's got to be a spring drink, right? The julep has a long history that I explore a bit in my episode on it, um, which there's a link for down there. Over its history, it's been made with a variety of base spirits, sometimes even split spirits and floaters. Um, but I favor bourbon in mine. I used Buffalo Trace back when I shot this one. 
Uh, it's still a perfect choice, but I gotta say, my beloved old granddad bottle and bond works very phenomenally in a uh, <laughs> in a mint julep. Um, I think that mint juleps are are both easy to over sweeten, but they do need to be sweet. If you've ever had like a cheap a cheap mint julep in New Orleans or something like that, you've probably had a glass of syrup. I know I have, and hated it. So they're easy to over sweeten. Uh, but they do need to be on the sweeter side. There's a line, they gotta go right to it and not over it. I keep the simple syrup in them to about a half an ounce. I actually like a couple of dashes of Angostura bitters in mine, which is not necessarily a standard choice, but possibly a historic choice you are free to ignore. I muddle the mint, uh, one that is another somewhat controversial choice. Uh, a lot of people do not muddle the mint. There's a whole thing where you just kind of like gently touch the mint inside of the, the beaker. I, I, I want mint in my, you know, it's a mint julep. I want it minty. I'm gonna muddle the mint. I go three ounces of bourbon uh, with crushed ice, stir or swizzle that a bit, finish with more ice, garnish it with as much mint as you can stand, and put your feet up, because you're in julep town. Another perfect drink for spring that I love in spring is, is a modern classic. It is the Gordon's Cup from the now long gone milk and honey, which was it the epicenter of the New York City speakeasy revival? It's debatable, but if not the center of it, it was certainly one of the brighter spots. Well, actually, it was a candlelit spot, but you know what I mean. I have yet to meet somebody who doesn't like this drink, um, or its breakfast version, the with hot sauce, the Gordon's breakfast. It's got cucumbers in it, therefore it's a spring drink. This is my show, I make the rules. To make it, you'll start by cutting up a lime and then some cucumber wheels. Shake the lime and the cucumber and three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, two ounces of London Dry together. Um, for London Dry, I love Ford's gin, um, but Tanqueray would be great here. I think Beef Eater is a gin that's wonderful. Um, I mean, uh, your big standards of gin. I, I think Gordon's is honestly maligned. I think Gordon's gin is fine. Uh, shake all of that together and strain it into a double old fashioned over rocks. Then add a few more cucumber wheels for garnish, a little kosher salt and black pepper. The drink is in, you're in paradise at this drink. It is heaven on earth. Any London dry gin will be fine here, I think. Uh, make this drink, you will love it. Uh, another neo-classic from the New York bar scene is Audrey Saunders's Earl Grey Martini. I did an episode on this where I talked about Pegu Club, the bar that she owned um, where this drink was invented and made famous. Uh, and I'm gonna put a link down there below. Uh, it was a very important hotspot in the kind of cocktail revival of New York City, okay? Um, one of my favorite bars too. It's a real bummer that it's gone, especially as pandemic might be lightning and I can't go back to my, all my favorite places are gone, it sucks. <laughs> ah, shit. Uh, to make this drink, you will need to make an Earl Grey tea infused gin. Uh, and the ratio for that is roughly four tablespoons of loose leaf twinings Earl Grey per 750 milliliter bottle of London Dry. And if you're trying to replicate the Pegu Club experience note for note, I'm told that they use Tanqueray. I used Ford's when I made it last time. I was very pleased at the results. They stood up admirably to what I was served at the bar. Uh, so I don't think that, you know, I think that a decent London Dry is going to suit you perfectly here. You put the tea into the gin, in the bottle, or in another bottle, shake it up, wait two hours, strain it all out, put it through like a fine tea strainer, a fine, fine tea strainer, maybe like a coffee filter, because you don't want less particles in there, the better. Um, strain it all out, Bob's your uncle. And that tea infused gin will be shelf stable. You can keep it, you know, at room temperature like gin. It's just gin with Earl Grey tea in it, it's great. For the cocktail, it's a sour and it presents as such. So it's an ounce of simple syrup, three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice, an ounce and a half of the infused gin with an egg white, Dry shake it, hit it with some ice, shake it again, strain it into a sugar rimmed coupe. Um, this drink was invented to be a crowd pleasing showstopper, and it is. It is easy to drink, it is a joy to all who encounter it. And what could be more spring appropriate than an Earl Grey tea at a garden party? I think it's perfect, it's a perfect drink. While well, I've been looking at these gin based sours, there's an original drink of mine, a drink I call a gin whisper. It's a positively ancient episode of how to drink, episode number five. Um, I recall liking it a lot. I invented it for a friend, I haven't drank it a ton since then. Um, but it's a great drink, if I'm not mistaken. I'd love to see how it holds up. I'm certain it belongs on a perfect spring drinks list, uh, when you see why in a minute. Um, it just hasn't come up in my life very much since then, so I I don't know. I, I haven't had it in a while, you know? Um, so to make it, you will need a shaker um, and a few mint leaves, and a very few. A lot of drinks with mint call for a large number of mint, like um, 10, 15 leaves. I made this, um, and I, I stand by this, with three mint leaves. Um, then a quarter ounce of simple syrup. Um, a quarter ounce of Saint-Germain. I always pronounce it Saint-Germain. 
I just recently learned that it's pronounced Saint-Germain. Saint-Germain. That's what I've been told. Saint-Germain. Saint-Germain. The Comte de Saint-Germain was a very famous vampire. Not like a fictional vampire, like a real one. Model that maybe now a little bit, you know? You can model it at any point, really. I think in the original I did the simple with the mint and then muddled. I'm going to muddle here. Just lightly press, you know? You just want to help the mint do its thing. There we go. Yeah. I mean, by lightly press, I mean press. <laughs> I don't know why I said lightly press. We're just expressing those oils. So a lot of my drink is now on my muddler, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave my muddler in there. I'm going to take two ounces of gin. I did it with Ford's previously. This Bullrush gin is a, an alternative that I really have been enjoying lately. It's an excellent gin available via Curiata in the link below. But, you know, use the London Dry or... I mean, you probably get away with like a couple of different kinds of gin here. See what I'm doing? I'm just kind of like literally rinsing my cocktail stuff off of my muddler to the degree that I'm able to, to make sure we get as much of that in the drink as possible. Now it goes with an egg white, and there's a bit of sorcery here. I'm just remembering all of this stuff. What I stumbled into that I did not know is that Saint Germain is actually super acidic, and in order to make an egg white do its thing in a cocktail, you need acid. Um, when I, I was just noodling around when I came up with this. So it was like one of those things where like I didn't know at that time that this would shouldn't work, but it works great. Dry shake. Ice, one big, one small. Take a sour glass like this one, if you have it, strain away. Probably should double strain this one, but I didn't grab my tea strainer when I came out here. I like to garnish that with like a tiny little, you know, like one of these like mint buds. You can take one of these guys and just put that right in the middle of the drink so it'll float. Just like that. I think that's perfect. Um, and there it is, the Gin Whisper. Ooh, that's really good. Oh my God. This is a perfect drink for spring. It is minty, fresh. Gin, um, the gin is really not dominant. Um, it has a sort of peppery quality to it. It is silky smooth with the egg white texture, which is well frothed. Um, the mint is just right. It is, is present without being overpowering, super mint. It has a light kind of fresh air to it. The Saint Germain is in balance with the mint. I did something okay when I made this one up a few years ago. I could see a touch, I mean, and I don't even mean just a touch of lemon, brightening it slightly, but that would change the character of the drink. And I, when I say a touch, I mean a quarter ounce, less than you would use in anything else, just a touch. Um, maybe a half an ounce, but a quarter probably is where I would start. Um, but I don't think it needs it. I stand by the name, I think it is a whisper. It is a gin whisper. It's elegant, refined, and subtle and lovely, really nice, very vegetal, very, I don't know, fresh tasting. What is that? What does that mean? What am I doing? Who knows? My hands are sticky. So is a caperinha a spring drink? I don't see why it shouldn't be. And I love the damn things. It's a Brazilian staple. It's refreshing and easy to drink. They are wonderfully simple and sloppy to make. I think they're perfect. Uh, you get yourself a shaker. You get some super fine sugar. You get a whole lime. You cut it into eighths. You muddle that with some sugar. You, you take two ounces of cachaça. 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 <laughs> Still have a hard time with that. You take two ounces of cachaça. I really like Nova Fogo. Shake that up and open pour it into a rocks glass. And when I say I really like it, it's because I've had some other cachaças since then. I don't like as much. Um, the, the Nova Fogo is like a real serious head and shoulders cut above the regular. That's uh, good stuff. One thing a lot of people have advised me about in regards to the Caperinha is that it's best practice to carve away the pith from the quartered up lime. That's the white bits that are in the middle. It can add unwanted bitterness. Even if you don't do this, it is an incredibly, unbelievably good drink. The cachaça is pretty forward here, which does break my spirit forward rule. So the bottle you use will matter. And as a result, I do strongly recommend the Nova Fogo because this is a drink that favors and, and features that cachaça. Uh, using using a, a, um, an unpleasant cachaça is not going to reward you, I don't think, personally. That's not to say that you would turn down a caperinha made with some hooch. 
Um, I certainly wouldn't. But if you're making it for yourself, I would get the good stuff. I think it's just you're going to like it a lot more. Uh, it's a yummy, 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 yummy drink. My last phenomenal drink of spring is a Paloma. Sure, like a lot of the drinks on this list, a Paloma is great any time of year. It's great in the summer on a hot day, but they're so darn refreshing. The whole thing drinks like a breath of fresh air after a winter hold up inside. It's like emerging from hibernation or crawling out of a dirt hole in the ground. I don't know. In a glass, you put that into a glass, put that whole concept into a glass, me crawling out of the dirt, r rising from the dead in a glass, that's what it is. The traditional way to make them is super duper simple. It is just a combo of squirt, grapefruit, soda, and tequila. And they're great that way. Um, I like some fresh grapefruit in mine. It's just a little bit more bitter and a little bit more, a little brighter. I like it that way. So I go with Ivy Stark's recipe because uh, it kind of bridges the gap between both ways to do this. It's four lime quarters, uh, two big wedges of grapefruit muddled together in a salt rimmed glass with some ice, two ounces of tequila. I love Fortaleza Reposado. Uh, three ounces of squirt grapefruit soda with a little mint, which I'm told is some gringo shit, but I don't care. I like it. You can skip the mint. Uh, and you have this neat magic trick of a disappearing cocktail because you'll have it in your hand and the next thing you know, it's gone. Where did it go? Who knows? Who could say? Guess I'll need to make a replacement. Oh, well. Well, I hope you enjoyed my top 10 drinks of spring. There's obviously a bunch of drinks I didn't include in this list. Um, very simple things like highballs, like Tom Collins, probably belong on the list. I didn't include it because um, this is my top 10 drinks of spring. Um, uh, and these are all drinks that I think of that really evoke the way I feel about spring, about the flowers in bloom and the birds coming back to life and singing their songs and the melt and the thaw and the lichens are freshening. The lichens are freshening. That's a normal thing, Greg. What? What? Yeah. So these are the drinks I think of when I think of spring. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Check out drink.curiata.com in the link below. If you're looking to pick up any of these bottles, make any of these drinks, that's gonna be a huge help to you. Probably, statistically speaking, it is likely that it will be a big help to you. If you're not in one of the states we can ship to, I apologize, but we're working on it, so check back frequently. Get yourself on, um, on a list or something so they can let you know. And I'm Greg. You will find me on Twitter at HowToDrink with a number in it. You'll find me on Instagram at HowToDrink with a number in the middle there, the number two. You will find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Greg from HTD, where mostly lately we are doing tabletop role-playing game actual plays on Tuesday nights, lately at 7 p.m. Nobody watches this. I can say anything I want here at this part of the episode. This is, this is over the episode. Listen, I've been making this show for a long time, like five years. Maybe some of these other things that we've done are interesting to you. Uh, until then which will not be very long. I'll, be, I'll see you next week. I'll see you in a couple of days with another episode. I'll see you in a couple of days with another episode of How to Drink. That was a mess. I didn't have anything written for the end there. I'm a mess. All right, I'm cutting.